2019, April. <laughs> this was the day that uh, Corals went into this tank for the first time, the BRS WWC hybrid, bringing together what we know from a commercial facility, production coral facility with uh, what you do at home. What have we learned? All right, that's what we're gonna go over today. Everything that we've learned in the last three years, you've seen the success of the tank, uh, hopefully by now. Uh, and I think I'm just gonna start hitting them up here, man. We got, I picked up a bunch of episodes here. So right. for those who don't know, this is Victor, uh, that uh, is one of the owners of WWC. This is Josh, the master behind, behind uh, uh, like uh, keeping all this stuff alive and growing up the systems, uh, kind of probably, the right hand of Victor. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, my right hand with Randy, dude, uh, bringing all this together. I We had untold hours putting this together. Oh, yeah. Huh. Too many, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, we learned a lot, though. So the I'm question, gonna, I think the, well, the question at the end is, are you going to answer, uh, uh, would you do it the same way? The answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> but I would You'll say 80% yeah. right. Uh, yes. Yeah. 20% yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, would make a couple of changes. A couple of tweaks. Yeah, and, and those changes actually happened throughout uh, the yeah. process mm -hmm. uh, and why a little bit what well, we struggled in the beginning and ultimately we uh, uh, had Found success. success yeah. Yeah. Right? But there weren't major tweaks, uh, there were just small changes along the way. All right, so I got a bunch of episodes here we pulled out, some things that uh, I think in this hour, this might be one of the most valuable hours that uh, most reefers could uh, spend because you're going to hear some of the biggest things that will help you be successful, especially with an SPS tank. Mm. So, start with number one. A reef, oh, this is episode seven. Reef tank biofilter for a stable, long-term aquarium. So this is like establishing a biofilter, not just like ammonia, man, but like mm -hmm. the whole thing. And the way we talk about it is biome now. Like, so how did we establish the biome uh, in this thing before? Does anybody remember? I think this one we just uh, did some uh, bottled bacterial supplements. Because uh, mm -hmm. it was dry rock, bare bottom. Uh, I mean, so there's nothing already established in here. Like right. uh, when, we were t when we were discussing with, you know, the biofilter, I believe in this episode with you, uh, is kind of where we got that idea of, um, you guys use a lot of pre pre-used live rock. I mean, oh, it's yeah. almost like Instatank, right? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a lot um, faster. Yeah, exactly. How old yeah. is some of the rock that we have? Uh, we got rocks that are over 10 years old, and, and definitely <laughs> helps. it helps with the cycle a lot faster. Oh, like, yeah, we like, take that for like granted. Lightning speed. Mm. That was the biggest lesson for me as I was listening to all this stuff about uh, bare bottoms and, you know, a four-week cycle and stuff. Mm -hmm. Here, we use almost exclusively dry rock, mm -hmm. and where in your systems, you're using almost exclusively super old established rock. Yeah, we don't, I mean, honestly, we don't even think about it anymore. We go to the back, we grab a nice piece of rock from mm -hmm. another tank, we add it, and it's, imme it's immediately done. Yep. You know? okay, so in this case, what we found is the first year was a monumental struggle. It was yeah. cyano outbreaks. It was dino outbreaks. It was... Uh, Ugly brown to the nth degree. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a giant pain in the butt. And we also, like, you think people sometimes say, like, you, well, you can just add biome with coral. Like, maybe, but we added a lot of coral. Uh, mm -hmm. And <laughs> maybe that's more true with uh, LPS than it is with SPS stems. I mean, because uh, you know, with the LPS, you got so much, essentially, rock structure. Yeah, very bottom, porous, right? too, yeah. 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 Uh, with uh, breaking off a little tiny frag and not even transferring the plug, not necessarily yep. true. <laughs> yeah. I think you started, too, mm -hmm. with uh, a handful of those dimpled um, bricks from mm. From Brightwell too, but dry too. Yeah, but they weren't established, yeah. man. That's right. Dry. Right. So what if those were established from yeah. another tank? Mm -hmm. We're starting to learn that maybe that would actually work. Uh, those things the work. <laughs> those things work, man. Especially they come wet out of. And this one of those oh things actually. God. Literally, we're talking about five minutes ago. Is why doesn't every fish store sell like established biomedia bricks where? you know, from a sterile, not sterile system, but like a system that doesn't have pests in it, for sure. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you can just go <coughs> grab one of these things, give it to a customer, and you know that you're adding the right things day one, right? To the yeah, table. instant cycle with that, you know, pretty much. So the, the evolution of this conversation, if you're not catching on for me, is this magic, uh, like, you know, I don't know, the tank isn't ready, but right, you right, can't right. really, d there's no words for the, it. The maturity, you know? it's like not mature enough is what you hear a lot. It's not mature enough for SPS. 
I think the evolution of that is the word biome now. Yeah. It's like, because it kind of encompasses like everything that's in the tank, like the, especially the things you can't see. Right. right. There's no explanation. It's like, you know, wait it out, but what are you waiting for? You know? <laughs> uh, so, so, question, right? This was the first bare bottom tank that you guys cycled, right? Uh, bare bottom? At scale, yeah. From so scratch? We did the, From kind zero? of the ULMs because the thought process behind the ULM was ultra low maintenance means no sand, which means I don't have to do that maintenance. So, we yeah. did the, we did the uh, bare bottom in those tanks. Not as huge of a you know, a hurdle to get past. Is this this much volume, right? How, How long were those set up for? If you remember though, actually, we had horrible time with mm. uh, the SPS yeah, that's one, true. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was no amount of water changes, no amount of anything. It was it too didn't clean. didn't stop the mortalities, man. It was too clean. There wasn't enough nutrients. A small tank and a lot of things people don't realize when you go bare bottom, you have to feed, you have to bring the nutrients in, you know? It was getting like biological blooms. It was just not stable, man. And the SPS it was out of whack. Not mm -hmm. LPS though, and uh, the softy one, pretty did much Did relatively okay. well. Yeah. But how long were those tanks set up before you gave up and Insta switched for some? Insta tanks, man. Yeah, yeah, they were. No, 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 I'm saying how long were they set up for you to get over that hurdle of that new tank? So the, the LPS tanks and the softy tank didn't really have the same new tank problem. Right, the SPS tank we have eventually moved it out of that super overtly complex oh. uh, <laughs> uh, system that is trying gallon. to like, automate everything known to man mm -hmm. on the 60 gallon cube. They put it into the E170, which meant uh, basically no skimmer, no uh, anything. <laughs> and they love uh, their socks. Don't yeah, the only thing we set it up on was uh, water, water change, mm -hmm. automatic water changes as the filtration. <laughs> Boom, man, took off. But also now the rock has been sitting in there for almost a year. Yeah, so that's the point that I was yeah. getting to. You know, yeah. you got to that year point, and I know the year is a fictitious number, but I mean, at a certain point, it does make a change for the better. It's the same thing in my own house, right? So we should keep going down this bare bottom path, man. I'm like, we're learning the lessons repetitively here. Because even before that, actually, we learned it in the experiment tanks. So when mm -hmm. we do experiments uh, in the lab, uh, you will find when we did bare bottom ones with no bricks, no. It's so filter. much yeah. harder to perform the experiments because mm. they get these blooms and they get all these problems. Even if I only put just like dry, you know, carob sea sand in the bottom, they're way more stable, and I can do the experiments from day one oh, way way better. So uh, like we learned it there, we learned it here, we learned the ULM, and even at my own house, I tried to recreate the bare bottom. Uh, using dry rock and stuff that even sat around for six months inside of uh, the tank, actually. When I turn the lights on, man, like explosion of what we call diatoms. What did you call it earlier? Like, I don't even remember. <laughs> it was, it was like a, a Filament. Diatomy crap. Diatomy. Ter terrible <laughs> explosive diatoms yep. or something. I don't remember. It's just not good. Yeah, well, you know what, though, is the solution to it wasn't throw magic elixir at it. It's just waited out man. Yeah. Mm. patience time and like and you know what? I just wait it out and you know when it goes away naturally in a way that it doesn't come back mm -hmm. yeah it just it, it was time I would say this is one hobby that money won't help you oh yeah you can yeah. have all the money in the world you still can still get this over and even if yeah. I try to move it it's not gonna look the same so mm -hmm. you have to have time and patience mm -hmm. patience and time over uh, money but like you know a lot of times when you're waiting if nobody told you and your tank just looks orange and filled with garbage and nobody told you, man, that this is more common than people <laughs> like to admit uh, and that if you just wait two months, it'll just go away. If nobody told you that, you just feel like a failure and then you end up dumping stuff in and solutions like over and over and over trying to solve it and you actually just extend it. And it, if somebody just gives you permission, Dude, let the crappy tank be crappy for a minute, and it'll come to the other side. <laughs> yeah, they try to force it. <laughs> and and the the big part there is then like, it's this mix of I will have to say anecdotally when you add corals to a tank, it seems to do better than if you didn't. Mm -hmm. But if I don't add corals to it, I can just leave the lights on and let it ride out its crappiness without worrying about what I'm killing. <laughs> You know, uh, so there's a double-edged sword there. But if I just have to let it ride out while all the dive times, everything's grown over all of the coral, 
bad news. Well, especially on like your first and second tank. Uh, this is, you know, I think some of the first tanks, and you know, you hear, you hear as a newbie, as a hobbyist, or as kind of a beginner hobbyist, take your time, it's patience, yada yada. But that goes kind of in one year and out the other. Yeah. You know, I want this thing to look awesome. I see every, you know, all of the stuff I'm looking at on the internet looks awesome, and I want it to get there as fast as possible. But then when you get to the point, like with the 360 or this tank, or you know, after you've set up multiples and multiples of tanks, that waiting game is. Ten times easier. It's just like, yeah, it's going to be ugly for a while. I'll come back in about three months. Well, they ready. they also have to learn that there is that period where you get that false sense of security. Oh yeah. You throw a couple corals in there. The corals look amazing. They're open so big. I've never looked. It's never looked so good. And then that stuff creeps up over the corals and kills it, or they just pale out and die because there's not enough environment there for it. And then again, like you said, they feel like a failure. Had they waited it out. That's a very hard thing to explain to new mm -hmm. hobbyists. They come to the store and they say, oh, my tank is cycled. They just tested my water. They think they're ready to put 10 fish, 50 corals, 100 snails, and they don't understand that, yeah, your tank is ready to take some bio load. Mm -hmm. It's got some form of bacteria to handle your waste, but it's not enough to just go out. And they don't understand that. It's hard to explain to them. They think, oh, I don't have ammonia anymore. I've been cycling it for two weeks. There's another piece to this that isn't true all the time, but I'm finding to be true most of the time, which is LPS tanks with LPS lighting just doesn't seem to have the same problem. Like even in my own house, when I had the, the explosion of all that garbage, it was because I was trying to cycle it to become an SPS tank, right? Mm -hmm. And that's had 350 par. And then when I decided to make it an LPS tank, all of a sudden all that stuff just kind of goes away much, much, much faster because there's like, you know, what, probably 20% of the overall uh, photosynthetic energy going into the tank, feeling that crap. So, like for you guys when you're watching this, you know, remember, like, when you, when, when you get these things, they're like, why does this problem happened to you and not you, and happens to you, but not me. There's always something about it. And when we set up all of these Insta tanks here, mm -hmm. and we've done it so many times, never had problems with these Insta tanks. All of them were LPS tanks. Yeah, all that's true. Yeah. Well, it's a, yeah. good, it's a good point to bring up anyway, because you should kind of have an idea when you're setting up a tank, you've done a little bit of research, you know what you want to do with it, you know? If you're not going for a full-blown SPS tank, then treat it like an LPS tank. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to be that much easier. You're mm -hmm. probably going to have that yeah. much more success. The beginning. That, is you know, the that was hard. That was hard to... Uh, I, I think back to you know, when my first tank, second tank. Uh, could I have made the conscious decision to go down, like, I want an SPS tank, or I want an LPS tank, or I want a mixed tank? I didn't even, one, I didn't even know what the hell those things were, and two, it's like, uh, but I want all the corals. Yeah. So, like, how do I plan for, man, I didn't expect to have that one, but that was really awesome, I want it, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, in, in maybe, maybe try in both types of tanks at the same time or something, but. You were probably running your lights turned up like it was oh. an SPS tank, too. Oh, yeah. Well, I wasn't measuring par, too. <laughs> yeah, so, so it was going at it. Yeah, I guess. All right. So, spirit of getting all this inside of an hour or something. Next uh, <laughs> episode here. Uh, this one won't be as long, but mechanical filtration. Protein skimmers, filter socks, and reactors. Mm. So, uh, like, has anything changed in your mind about how you use a protein skimmer or mechanical filtration since uh, uh, 2019 April? Well, so your guys' take on this one. So there was the the, uh, the WWC approach, the BRS approach, the hybrid approach. And I think for you guys, uh, it was all, your mantra was always simple, right? Mm -hmm. simple, simple, simple and stable. Simple and stable. So filtration for you guys, these big giant uh, recirculating skimmers and filter floss, and that's about it. And water yes. changes, yeah. lots of filter floss. Yeah, lots, lots of filter, of filter floss. floss. Cause it's throw a uh, takeout and throw dump it in the away. trash with the you know, all the poo in the trash yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I notice if the tank is too clean, just get rid of the filters, the filter floss, and you get more food for the corals. <laughs> yeah. So what's changed since uh, 2019 about that? The, the floss is exactly the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think, <clears throat> I think maybe we moved away from filter socks even further. Mm. I think at that point, maybe we had a dozen or so filter socks that we'd use. Now it's 100% floss. Mm. Um, no refugiums, no. no scrubbers, still not, yeah. No. Um, 
And of course, the, the skimmers, you know, Vic and I talk about it all the time, the, the skimmers are so efficient that we really don't need to run them as much as we should. Mm. So we talked about this morning is like the skimmers in many cases are just turned off into your tanks. Right? A lot of time. Uh, and uh, sometimes you even stop doing the filter fl uh, floss and Yeah, well, and when stuff. I realize that it's too clean, you know, and the corals look a little pale, you know, get rid of the filter fl for a couple of days and you'll see a big difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the here's the big bit though. So as a viewer here, I'd be like, ah, well, I don't need to do oh, this. Yeah. Don't right? do that. Okay. No. <laughs> you should see how stuck No, you're going to get algae blooming everywhere. you got to understand your tank very well. <laughs> there is two differences here between what you're doing at home and what they're doing. One is how many gallons of water leaves these systems a week going inside of a uh, fish or a, a coral bag? bag. Uh, well, I know, <laughs> okay. no, so I know, I know the answer right? to that. It, yeah. on, a, on a good day, we can move 150 gallons of water out of one system just mm. bagging corals. Yeah. yeah, so there's water changes that are happening there that do not happen at your yeah. house because you're bagging up so much water to yeah. pull out to go to the coral. And that's just in the shipping side. Okay, the other thing is, is these tanks from day one have an enormous amount of coral. I mean, uh, mm. maybe not day one, but like these tanks that they're running here are enormous amount of coral. Yeah, essentially, you don't even see the rock. Essentially, <laughs> the coral is like its own Filter. Like, a different type of refugium. Yeah. It's not algae. I'm growing the coral, it yeah. grows tissue, I'm soaking up the nutrients, and then by shipping it to somebody's house, I'm exporting it from the tank. Sure, there's, there's another variable too. These guys are constantly taking containers of water out to use for fragging, mm. rinsing, so on and so forth. And then on top of that, not only is there a lot of coral, but there's a lot of frag plugs. They're super porous too. I mean, how is that any different from your ceramic medias that you guys use? Mm -hmm. You know, and there's thousands and thousands yeah. on a regular basis. This is what's changed for me since 2019 that I've found to be true is uh, filter socks decrease the performance of the skimmer. Uh, and I actually got that from Royal You mean when they're new? When they're new? No, like uh, just general. This is why. Uh, so when I talked Sorry. to the Royal Exclusive, what they shared with me was if you use their roller mat thing, uh, the fleece filter, you have to get a much smaller skimmer because uh, you're pulling out most of those turds and fish food before it even gets it to the skimmer. The skimmer. <laughs> and so what you'll end up with is this giant sized skimmer that, that doesn't have enough organics to actually produce anything. Right? Well, so you're looking at the metric being the, the production in the cup. Yeah, production to cut. So basically he's telling you, you don't need to buy such a big skimmer because it's not going to operate at its capacity all the time. And I've also found that an oversized skimmer works worse than an undersized it's true. skimmer, right? Yes. So it's true. Uh, what happens then is if I, what they basically they said is like, if you're going to use filter socks, especially fleece that pulls it out in almost real time, you need half the size of skimmer that you would need without this thing. That makes sense. Okay, and this also matches my own anecdotal experience, which is any single uh, tank that I use filter socks in, the skimmer just doesn't produce the same way it does if I don't have the filter <laughs> socks because it's all getting caught in there. Yeah, similar to what I was telling you earlier. Now, one thing though in all of this is, in a roller mat, that makes a lot of sense because you're pulling it out, at least it's coming out one way or another, who cares? But if you're using filter socks and you never change them, which is probably half of you, uh, <laughs> the, 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 flowing through the top. Yep, it's making noise. Well, now the skimmer also is performing poor, poorly, and all the organics in the filter sock is rotting back all the way down to elemental like nitrate and phosphate, which Waste. the skimmer can't pull out. So the filter sock, if you leave it in there, is actually creating more nitrate and phosphate Makes in sense. the tank because you can't export it with the skimmer anymore. That's one of your biggest pet peeves when you see food going down the overflow. I was just telling him. <laughs> it, 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 it's in the sock. I was like, don't feed so much. He goes, it's normal. I'm like, we we'll split it on two. Yeah, so what I see from you guys is maybe feed the same amount, mm. but smaller amounts more frequently. Yes, right? mm -hmm. and then the fish will eat it all. Which is the opposite, by the way, of what the hobby tends to tell us all, which is like, well, these fish, you can feed them once every three days. Mm. Well, I think Meanwhile, that's Meanwhile, fish are dying. I, don't know, I think know? that's an artifact <laughs> of most of the hobbyists being uh, not around their tank 24-7 or the whole working day here is that, yeah, your fish will make it once a day, so don't feel bad that you only get to feed them in the morning or you only get to feed them at night because yeah. you're not there all day. But funny you say that, even uh, though you're not, my, my thing is I don't want you to feed the fish all day is, if you have an ounce of food, don't feed the whole ounce, feed a quarter ounce, come back 20 minutes later, 10 minutes later, mm -hmm. 
You can even stand there, feed, two minutes later, watch the fish, the fish eat it, and then just add a little more. Then all of, as long as you're adding, it's being consumed. That's, it's not the amount that you're putting, it's just how, how you're dumping it all at once, you know? The well, fish the, get bored. From the coral standpoint, when we were there last, you guys had like a timer where somebody mm -hmm. had to like, goes out. Oh, yeah. an egg, <laughs> an egg timer. Once an hour. Yeah. I'm sorry? It's just an egg timer. Yeah, yeah how often do they feed uh, uh, the, the tanks? Every hour. Mm -hmm. A small amount every hour throughout the whole day. Uh, this is probably great for the coral, probably great for even the fish. Think of the ocean. Oh yeah, there's awesome. food available 24/7. Mm -hmm. Those corals are not. Who's gonna feed us? There's just there's food in the in the in the water. Right, we eat three times a day. So this is yeah. the, the fish this, aren't the same. <laughs> this is the frustrating part for me. Is like, like anecdotal theory. You know, trumps everything these days, right? Or always, really. So, uh, well, I only feed every three days. My fish uh, do just fine. So that's kind of like the mentality that I've been told for 20 years, right? But like. That's the mentality of like, I haven't killed it yet. Yeah, that's you know? true. And yet, meanwhile, fish are driving? dying. Fish are dying all the time, and I don't know why. Well, <laughs> you know, honestly, right diet. honestly, that's crap. I mean, think about think about the animals that we're keeping. Most of these animals are found in the surf. Mm -hmm. There's a really high metabolic rate. There's a lot of energy. You know, there's just a lot of things happening. It can't go without some sort of input. Mm -hmm. You know, it's impossible. Things don't sustain. You know, it's interesting too, because I was talking to Elliot the other day and he was talking about like trying to feed the animals the stuff they eat. Like and he was talking actually about a Moorish idol, which is generally considered to be like a difficult, difficult. to maintain fish. He's like, it's not difficult. All you gotta do is feed it a lot of a high fibrous algae diet frequently. Uh, and then it won't be a problem. It's just a diet thing. But meanwhile, the rest of the hobby is telling you you can feed uh, every Silver other size. day some freshwater <laughs> shrimp, which is protein and not a high fiber diet. <laughs> uh, water. And like it's not leading us in the right direction. Gotcha. Yeah, so, uh, very interesting. But this now leads into the next question, which is mm. uh, that might be one of the hotly debated uh, topics ever. But okay, episode nine best nitrate and phosphate level for a reef tank. Well, first up, is there one? Everybody's got different opinions on that. I like to see a, a small reading of phosphates. And what would you say, George? Between 10 and 25, we like to keep our nitrates, ideally? Our goal in the entire building, if you if you count all 49 systems or whatever the heck there is there, we shoot for under 25. Mm -hmm. There's some- or nitrates. There, yeah, there, there's some tanks that don't like it at all. Mm -hmm. There's some that could stand to have more. Our 1500 is one example. If our nitrates get to 30, they're not showing any signs of wear. And the mm -hmm. coils, the polyps all out. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't get that optimal color. And, you know, that's one of the things that, that hobbyists take out of context. Just because they can live in it doesn't mean they want to. And just because they are living in it doesn't mean it's optimal. So it, uh, I, I got a curious a question I don't know the answer to, mm -hmm. but... In your opinion, high nitrate and phosphate versus low, which one's going to produce a better colored tank? Generally lower, you're going to get more of that pearlescent color. Mm. Okay, uh, high nitrate and phosphate uh, versus low, which one's going to produce faster growth? A balanced amount of mm. both. <laughs> the right Good amount. <laughs> But it might be really low, then produces a little bit more of that pastel -y, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. glow. Generally. So, so I got a little story since we're talking about phosphates and nitrates. Mm -hmm. uh, about two weeks ago, I looked at Josh. We have, um, we have these quarantine systems. The, there are 80-gallon tanks, and we have 10 of them. They're all uh, individually plumbed and everything. And we have this Montipora that is grafted. It's a yellow Montipora, by the way, with red that we've been working on for a while. And I looked at Josh and I said, Josh, what happened to this month? He goes, what do you mean? I said, they looked a little bit, not vibrant, they look brown. So we go to our uh, manager that is working on the farm and we ask him what happened. He says, oh, what we think happened, uh, we tested the tank and it had a, the phosphates were too high. So what they did, mm. they grab a media reactor, they put a bunch of phosphate in it and they put on the 80 gallon tank. The problem was, Prior to this, they've been putting phosphate in a bag. Yeah. So it's not the same efficiency. Right. So the tank was looking fantastic. They just went on a reading and said it's too high. They dropped it. Guess what happened to the coals? They went brown. Oh, yeah. When I tell you brown, I mean, it was horrible. The mushrooms shrank. 
the, the Monty Ports, they turned brown. They went from Viber to brown. Mm -hmm. And all we needed to do was like, was the tank looking good? Yes. Are the false face high? Yes. Lower them a little Slow, bit. Don't panic. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. So the question in there is, uh, did the corals hate the fact that they like phosphate? Or did they uh, hate the fact that you stripped it all out like that? <laughs> I uh, think it's the fact the, that we stripped it all out like yeah. that. The, it was the, a point, shock. the point is, is it probably took a good while for it to get to that high point. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then to... So, so the difference between the two is, is honestly the culprit. So there's no question also that high phosphate levels will inhibit calcification. Poisons the mm -hmm. calcium carbonate crystal, it's just real. So oh, I've, had, I've just experienced that firsthand in my own tank. As soon as I brought the phosphates down from the uh, de now detectable in my HANA, growth, color, coralline, mm -hmm. the whole thing. Yeah, so like uh, there is some magic amount, and that one's like a really sp probably a small window of perfection that mm -hmm. nobody knows what it is. Yeah. And like so people ask me all the time, like, well, what's the right nitrate and phosphate level? And uh, this is. There isn't an answer that's not that's 100% satisfying. That's so, why I say under 25 or under point. But not, but not zero. Just some some you need some small reading of both. Yep. If you get zero reading on both, you're gonna have a sterile tank and you're gonna have a tough time coloring up the corals. So for me, zero right. zero is a, the worst idea of the bunch, right? Uh, but we were all taught in the past 20 years, you need tons of light as much as you can, tons of flow. Your nitrous gotta be zero. Your phosphate's gotta be zero. And now we're talking about it 20 years later, and we're starting to realize with all this information that we have that you need some sort of readings, you know? Okay, so zero, zero, though, came from a world of algae and stuff was mm. our problem back 20 years ago, mm. right? It's not the same problem anymore. I mean, like, it, just understanding what a yellow tang does changes that conversation, <laughs> right? Uh, but, like, our, we had all these pests and stuff back then. They were trying to solve through n nutrients, and they worked. And so you brought up a good case of the, or, or, or a good talk about the, the reactor versus the media bag. Yeah, media bag, yeah. So the media bag is a really good solution for keeping the levels in a manageable range. Mm. The uh, reactor <laughs> is a great. It's not a drop them. Yeah, it's a great solution for fighting hair algae because you're going to starve it out until it dies. Yeah, there's but, a difference between between maintenance and remediation. So, but mm. here's the thing: anything that kills things in the tank has some risks associated to it. And so, uh, if it's going to starve out the algae, the hair algae it is going to affect the zooxanthellae inside the coral as well. That, and yes. there's no way that isn't happening. With one exception, if you happen to be able to get the coral enough prey type food and amino acids mm. that's able to get nitrogen and phosphorus from that, that's probably the only exception to that case. But if you're gonna strip out all that stuff using a reactor, it's super, super efficient. The media bag is not efficient. It but works, but it's not as efficient. Yeah, but here's the thing, man, is it's going through that sump, like, all the time, you yeah. know, over and over and over throughout the day, mm -hmm. right? So it, it gets so many passes, even if it's not that great at, at doing it, there's so many passes that throughout the next three days, it will slowly get most of it, you know? And it will never get all of it, which means you always have some amount. Yeah. So in many ways, the media bag may be better. Okay, uh, the one thing I'll say, I don't know, 25 is certainly working at the farm. Nobody will tell you that that is not 25 case, and under. Right? I will tell you zero and zero is a terrible idea, but the only thing I will tell you beyond that, somewhere in between those ranges is perpetually rising is the only thing worse than zero, zero. Well, there's, you know, I say under 25 because it's, it's the safe answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I'll be honest with you, there's probably 60% of the tanks are at 10, yeah. mm -hmm. and they just stay at 10, and, so, you know, that's just the way that they are. So. I don't really care if you where you pick, somewhere in there, mm. but if you measure it today and it's 5, and you measure it a month from now and it's 10, uh, and you measure a month from then it's 15, that's going to somewhere bad. You should just figure out, your stop putting as much food in there, or up your filtration game just so it's stable. So, like, it doesn't matter, man, where you are in there. And when I say it doesn't matter, that's not totally true but you can produce a really successful tank anywhere in that range. Yep. All right, next one. All right, flow. Episode 10, the backbone of a stable, stunning reef tank. 
This one changes to how you guys adjust flow now? Still the biggest challenge, yeah. how to deliver flow correctly right. to a reef tank. Because when you start a reef tank, yeah, it's plenty of flow, but what do you do when the crews grow like here? Yeah. That's yeah. a rock now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yes. blocking the flow. <laughs> so this coral here next to it, that it was getting tons of flow, now it's no longer. So mm. you got to make adjustments, you know? That speaks to, you know, kind of what we've been talking to, talking about, you know, since this, uh, I guess since this flow episode, there was a couple things that came out of this series. One was, uh, you know, the bare bottom and the whole, you know, one of the whole purposes of the bare bottom is so that you can increase mad amounts of flow oh, because Josh double, said you're going to ride in the rage, razor's edge with par flow is actually more you I think you you said par flow is actually more important mm -hmm. than the light and the That's par so and the thing that. like that well and then you know over the last you know few years since we've done this uh, we're starting to talk about you know uh, the different flow patterns that you get from pumps and how to use those different flow patterns to solve just what you said is here we are in this tank three years later and now that coral's a rock and it's blocking all the flow. Yeah. It's three years later I have to change my flow. I, I gotta think about it. It ain't gonna work for the next seven years. No, wait till they grow more. Yeah. So there's, there's two variables that I consider pretty heavily when we talk about flow. <clears throat> One, getting the crap out of the tank. Mm. You know, so, so su suspending all the lighter materials that can go down to filter. And then two, the coral health, right? So we, we constantly are, are making a visual analysis on a regular basis of these corals to make sure that we see what we want from them. You know, mm -hmm. we were talking about the hammers just a little while ago. If the hammer doesn't open up, it's probably not ha happy there. <laughs> well, it's probably a flow-related issue, right? Yeah. But those, those two keys are really, really important. So, you know, in our mindset, which has not changed, it's still the same. We deliver as much flow as we can to the point where the corals are almost not happy with it just to get that, that, that stirring action, mm -hmm. the, the suspension of the waste and then figure out if the corals can be happy in that environment and what we can do to modify their health. All right, so I haven't talked about this with you guys. I'm, I'm curious what you think about this. Shoot. Sure. Okay, uh -oh. so uh, I have definitely found, I've, one of the things I've changed on the 360 more than anything else is flow because I'm constantly <laughs> trying to figure out uh, the perfect thing, especially in a peninsula where I want to look good and uh, provide the right flow. Peninsulas are the toughest ones to deliver flow. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are, yep. period. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we've been blowing bubbles and everything in there, but also what I've, I've I wish learned, I saw that. <laughs> uh, what I've learned uh, is that 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 you said like right at the point where they don't like it, right? Mm -hmm. So I decided to take this approach, and I can't wait to hear what you think. Well, I've learned that lighting and flow are interconnected. Prim one of the main reasons is because as photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis energy goes up and the rate of photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis goes up, it produces more oxidants and byproducts that it, the coral needs to get rid of itself. It needs to get out of it or it will bleach, right? So that's like why they bleach in the ocean in many cases. So this, we gotta get rid of all those oxidants and we're gonna ramp the flow up to help uh, uh, get rid of that gas exchange. But I got my lights ramping up throughout the day, right? So the rate of photosynthesis is going up, and I'm butchering that word every time I say it, <laughs> uh, but uh, as it goes up, so I decided to take the flow and do the same thing, which is push it to the max. Well, the light is the max, and then let it come down so I can give the corals a break of not getting blasted like hmm. that when it's not necessarily, or may not be necessary to hit it with that much flow when the energy level has gone down and the rate of all of the oxidants and byproducts have slowed down as well. Is this anecdotal and crazy, or what do you guys think? No, I, I, I actually like the concept for an almost completely unrelated reason. I gotta uh, hear it. Corals generally feed at night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so so in that process, there has to be, they don't reach out and just grab food. They mm -hmm. don't, the reflexes aren't like that, right? Yeah. So a lot of it is passive collection, you know? So, so if there is any particulate, if there's anything available in the water column for these animals, that's the opportune time for them to capture. Can I hear somebody? Go well, and, and you think about like the, at that time of day when the ocean is, you know, calmer than it was during the day, 
like the, the, the ability for these corals to capture a slower moving prey mm -hmm. than one that's going right by them or smacking into the side of them mm -hmm. because the flow is so heavy. There's like no I fish just, picking at yeah, them it in makes, the wild. It makes sense, like turn, this, th turn it down at night and the corals feed at night because it's a just easier mm -hmm. targeting prey. So somebody uh, once had a, had a, was at a discussion on a forum and they are like, well, the uh, currents don't change at night or whatever, right? So why would we change the current? What are you talking about? <laughs> okay, well, there's a difference, there's a difference in the currents Sorry, you're, you're wrong. <laughs> well, somebody actually responded with something really smart, which is weather creates, uh, yeah. for, and there's way more weather during the day than there is night because sure. of the sun's energy creating mm -hmm. the weather. Yeah. And at night, it's way calmer. And it's absolutely true, unless you're talking about 60 feet deep, in which current that is like, the there's same. currents, but those are like where your euphilias and stuff are coming from, and I don't know the exact footage, but you know, deeper coral, or uh, deeper, and they could very well have more gentle, continued current mm -hmm. that doesn't change a lot, but in these high flow SPS tanks, there's absolutely in the wild, weather is causing different flow patterns in the day than they are at night, and at night they're feeding. So even, even with both theories put together, no matter how you want to look at it, if you're gonna do a mixed reef tank, it's probably in your best interest to try to cater to that scenario mm -hmm. for each type of coral. To the best you right. So, quick question real quick before we jump to the next one. Brandon Ryan, have you guys ever seen an Acropora at three o'clock in the morning, turn the lights on in the middle of the night, and a oh, healthy yeah. Acropora mm -hmm. tank? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen those clear tentacles? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, 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 yep. So, one time we let our nitrates go over 40, and it wasn't on purpose. I was going to a trade show, and we come in the middle of the night to get coral for the trade show, and I turned the blue lights on to see this, the old 300 gallon tank. This is 10 years ago. Yeah. Until today, I can't forget that it looked like aliens. They were literally <laughs> inch and a half long, feeding tentacles that it comes only at the tip of the acropora. Yeah. And it's something that not many people have ever seen, so I figure you share that. You know, you were talking about how they eat at night and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It is mesmerizing if you ever see that, you know? Go at 3 a.m. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you got a bunch of aquapores and they're healthy, please, in the well, middle, smack in the middle of the night, yeah. turn the lights on, and you're going to be like, what you know is what? this? We should, we should ask everybody for like a photo. Of the 3 a.m. Um, um, the 3 a.m. I'm going to try to do a video. <laughs> Hashtag 3 a.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we can do a video of the tank in the middle of the night. That would be cool. Sure. Hey, while you're at it, feed sure. it too, because you know, like obviously they're looking for something. Yep. All right, 3 a.m. <laughs> Hashtag uh, 3 a.m. Reef. All right, next one here was... Uh, <laughs> Uh, SPS, episode 11, mm. SPS reef tank lighting made simple and stable. I've learned a bunch of stuff about lighting. We'll keep it kind of short here yeah. because there's just a couple of ways that really work really well. What's the number one thing you've learned uh, in the last three years? Maybe you already knew, but reinforced. The, and specifically in the last three years since we've done this? Well, we, you know, specifically in the last three years, we've kind of gotten rid of T5 altogether. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like 100%. I, I, I'm not even going to joke when I say I was really nervous. We did radions for the first time, and then we moved away from when we went back to T5. And then we went back to radions, and it was that day. Vic says, we just got to figure it out. They work. We know they work. We just got to figure it out. We got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And then since then, it's been kind of this onward and upward approach, and eventually the T5s just kind of faded away. And it's, hmm. That's what I got actually when I toured your facility back then is right here we had our most successful tanks were T5 uh, LED hybrids, the yep. 160, mm -hmm. the E170, yep. all that kind of stuff. And then it came to your guys' facility and it was basically the same thing. A lot of the tanks were T5 LED hybrids. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were talking about this this morning, but like basically in that scenario what we did is kept the T5s, we replaced the halides with LEDs. Right. right? Uh, now you've seen, I uh, you don't see a set of tanks with T fives anymore. It's just you know. It's becoming yeah. more rare and rare, man. Uh, you know, I, honestly, I don't like the Windex color of the bulb. Uh, I like the fill, but I've figured out how to provide fill in different ways. And I think, for me, the benefit of the T5 wasn't that the bulb is some kind of magic spectrum mix. It was that it was this is a big blanket of light. So there's 18 million ways to create a big right. blanket of light. Just, just <laughs> do that, and that's what we found. And you see in all your facilities, it's a big blanket of LED light, and it's producing coral in a production from facility. Every, from every single angle, you yeah. know, from, from wild corals to aquaculture corals to every type of coral, you know? You know, there's, there's still debate 
you know, can you get that much better color out of a halide or a T5? And I'll be probably one of the first to admit that, you know, Sean and I were the the longest that lived T5 me. guys in the Dinosaurs. shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, <laughs> we tried so hard to hang on to that, but I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. You can't deny there's there's 250 radions in our farm. Maybe more. Maybe more. The farm, you, know, you know, there's 250 radions in our farm, and if they're not growing nice coral, then I'd be lying by saying so. So this one also uh, all radions. At some point in time, though, we switched from the G4s to the G5, so we had like a whole grid eight. of uh, eight or yeah. so mm -hmm. of, of the G4s, mm -hmm. uh, 15s. And then when Randy did the investigates and found out the spread on the G5s meant in a two foot almost area, the par on the outside ring was within 20% 20 20%. of the center. Yeah, I mean, like the technology and the incredible. distribution of light yeah. has changed so 20 much. 20% within the center? I mean, That's not much of a change. All, yeah. Most of the other LEDs are using par. lenses and like trying to focus the light to create mm. artificial par spots for marketing. Uh, <laughs> whereas you know, when you actually take it to the application of care, caring for the animal, huge diffuse spread of light is the, the right move. Mm -hmm. We changed over to uh, uh, the four of the uh, G5s, yeah. wide angles mm -hmm. here, diffused. And there's no question, man, I can't tell you exactly, I mean, this tank took totally turned around at some point and just took off. And part of it, I believe, is even going from the G4s to the G5s. Uh, but in any case, just wide overlapping uh, 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 lights, and I'm, I'm gonna probably piss somebody off here at uh, Egotech, but you know, they market it as for two feet. I find 18 inches for an SPS tank is the right move. Mm. Yeah. So you saw the the Acro tank in our Winter Park store, right? Mm -hmm. What is there, six? There's six and it's a five tank. by three? Five mm. by three, yeah, that is the tank. It's way overkill. And it's but I'll tell tall. you, I say the tank is and, 20, 20 inches and this is uh, 21, yeah. 21, there you it, go. So it's a, it's a dangerous conversation saying that this tank may have taken the turn for the better at that point in time because everybody always wants to point their finger at the light and say oh the light is the reason why my tank's not doing good or the light's the reason why my tank's doing bad right mm -hmm. but our winter park store for sure since we did that with those those gen, gen oh fives, the tank and gen, gen fives, gen fives gen yeah gen. literally night and day so but it's because they are on top of one another yeah. there's no space for any other yeah shadows is it shat the part we lost in it before, even before, was like, okay, you can measure wide angle, mm -hmm. but wide angle like can be shadowed. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's like if any of the obstructions there, but if you start spacing these things close together, the cones overlap, and now there's no shadow because it's illuminated from both sides. Uh, Something I want to tell you. So before we met you, Ryan, I want to say, Josh, 2012, we got the first. We switched our entire store for Gen One um, radians. radians. And at the time it was fairly new, and we just made a rash decision just to get rid of the T5s and metal highlights, and we got the Gen 1s. It was 10 180 gallon tanks, three lights on each tank, mm -hmm. so you do the math, uh, 30 radians. And within a month or two, we didn't like it. We hated it. Chalices mm. turned brown, Aikens turned red. They were like, orange. like this burnt orange that they will get, and we got rid of them. Mm -hmm. We went back to our T5, some middle highlights. That must have been a year or two. Immediately happy going back. Do you remember, remember right. New York Steelio? Immediately. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember New York Steelio? Mm -hmm. He's a YouTuber. YouTube, no. New York Steelio. He yeah. had a really popular channel, and I, he never really explained what happened here, so I don't know. Uh, but uh, kind of fell off. He, well, he called what me up and asked me for a deal on Radians. I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, Dude, whatever. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's another fellow YouTuber. And then, miraculously, the tank kind of took a dump and uh, he disappeared. But Gen 1 Radions, man. That's why. Well, so, <laughs> so that's what well, that's it. Yeah, well, and that's the thing is, like, back, think about when Gen 1 Radions were out there, Gen 1, any of these LED lights, it was par wars. We had no idea. Like, the things we're talking about with, you know, even distribution of light and par ranges in these target ranges, none of these conversations were happening back then. So well, all we, we're doing is producing, you know, technology that has this <laughs> laser beam and say, ah, see guys, I can get 1500 par. How about your light? Mm -hmm. And then you just buy it be based off of that. Trailblazers oh, yeah. shot in the back. No. The problem, <laughs> another thing is, yeah, we can say with the maybe Radeon 1 wasn't the best light, but I also believe 
it was so new for people to use an LED light and control it mm. that people were like, I want this to be blue yeah. all day. Well, you like, remember, we had, and, and it el actually helped make the decision on Tank 6, we had those AI souls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were doing blue, really good. Blue and white. Yeah, yeah, they were doing mm -hmm. really good. So it gave us that little confidence to move into the, the Radeon, so too. So this was the hard part of Gen 1s, though. Like, it's not just about the technology. It's about how the technology is used. Mm -hmm. it is that thing was so strong, and if I spent all this money on a fancy light... I wanted to use it. I wanted to use, use it. You and you wanted, you're going to get the blue out of it. And the reality is when I'm looking at it, a brighter tank always looks better to the eye. Yeah. So I crank it up to 80% when I really needed it to be at 30 and nobody was using a par meter at the and time. And people didn't yeah. understand the strength of the slice either, you know. So then, like I said, once we got rid of our Gen 1, we went back to Metal Highlights. And then I think we skipped Gen 2. Then Gen 3 came around and everyone started saying how well it works and we give it another shot. And at the time, we, we switched them back to all um, Radeon 3s, and we had a couple, a couple of T5s with them. Mm -hmm. And when we moved to the new facility, I say, Josh, we're going 100% only these. The thing has been working. And like you were saying earlier, him and Sean, they were like, oh, my gosh, can we keep a couple T5s? And till today, guys, <laughs> they're constantly giving me a hard time. Like, there was one tank that it had one fixture of T5, and I go, guys, can we just get rid of it? The frack <laughs> thing in the office, there was mm -hmm. one. So, yeah, I think we're 99%, 100% lady. I think there's one, one little T5 fixture in one tank, I think, going around. I think that's it out of literally too many tanks. Yeah, I just saw the one fixture when I was there. Uh, I'll give you, actually, an interesting note about the 360 here. So I had two of the Skies, which is a big platform, wide-angle light on a five-and-a-half-foot deep tank, right? right. Uh, and so I had two of those Skies in there. And visually, it looked really well illuminated. And there's also a couple of Kessels in there, too. And it's like, well, you know what? I'm going to go with this, which is like one big module about every two and a half feet from mm -hmm. center. Uh, but then when I went to measure it, I'm making sure, you know, you guys are bringing the corals here and stuff. And I'm going to measure. And I'm like, God, you know, there is 450 here. And then there's, you know, 150 over here. So even visually, it looks even. It, it is Not even close, right? yeah. We added the two other uh, skies, so now that there is three of them in over a five and a half foot area, and we raised them up about six more inches, and oh. now, man, it's just as flat as it gets. Mm. It is, you it know, looks good. the very corners are 200, it's 350 at the very tippity top, which means almost the whole tank is in the exact <laughs> range we want it. It was just the addition of two lights that you would never ever be able to get with the eye, unless you're a super duper pro. Uh, but with a meter, man, you can get for sure. Okay. I guess you're pro, or I guess you're <laughs> power in the middle of the tank. There you go. You did actually. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's interesting. Like uh, you do it for a living, uh, or you'll get closer to it for sure. But for the average person, I mean, we actually took. A, I did an experiment here a while back. Took a bunch of people and have them try to guess the par, mm -hmm. and nobody could do it. That's and, awesome. And uh, you know, it's just like it's your eye auto irises to brightness. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how can you pick it? We just know what it looks like more or less based on <laughs> past measurements. You know. All right, so I'm going to move on here. Uh, major, minor, and trace elements for your reef tank. We did, uh, in this case, the uh, calcium reactor here. Yeah. I'll tell you my own personal opinion. The calcium reactor is, for a tank this size, it is kind of a lot of rigmarole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because two part on this side is still affordable yeah. and really easy to do, yeah. but on a monster tank, two part is not affordable. No, on a fifteen hundred, you're gonna go broke. Yeah, you go totally go broke. But on a tank that it's a this size, a two part jug, man, would be way easier than modern all that stuff. And then I'm also gonna increase the pH instead of decrease it. Right. And another piece I'll say is in the beginning when they're all tiny and they're not sucking up all that excess CO2, they don't need as much. It actually lowers the pH. Now it does it because the corals actually suck up all the extra uh, CO2 through uh, the whole process. So like, it's it's we don't have the same problem. Yeah. Is it in a robust full tank of coral? The the calcium reactor doesn't seem to have any effect on the pH. Okay. Well, that's an interesting point too. Is like so since we've done this one, we're talking about calcium reactors, and you guys are all on calcium reactors. But there was a point where you guys were you uh, dosing uh, phosphate E, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you still dose phosphate E? In yeah, the larger in systems. In the larger yeah. systems. 
So we, we, we did the way. calcium reactor media testing, and you guys use like the coral skeleton bit type mm -hmm. media, yeah. right? Well, we found that they, there are there's 200 times phosphate in that media. It's still bound up in that oh, media, yeah. but you go to like the dolomites and the calcites, you know, the stuff that's been underground for ancient, ancient times, zero, unregisterable, or, or yeah, or synthetic uh, material, zero or nothing. And it makes you kind of makes you wonder, is like. Would if you change if you guys changed media, would that kind of solve that uh, needing the phosphate? Not really, because there's but a your, lot of food. your bio load and yeah, whatnot. The amount of food that we put in there. There was I did. There's a I think Hams's Reef has a calculator for how much phosphate's coming out of your reactor for your system volume, mm -hmm. and when you enter it in, you want to throw up. <laughs> uh, well, here's the thing. <clears throat> if <clears throat> let's say for example we take the calcium reactors offline. How much input of of organic material can we physically put in with the amount of coral mass that we have mm -hmm. to maintain that? Mm -hmm. Maybe a calcium reactor is part of our success now oh, because be. of mm -hmm. the fact yeah. that it's actually dumping phosphate in there. Mm. Well, I'm trying to solve the salinity issue of, yeah. uh, of on, on 1,500 gallons. Two part on a 1,500 gallon tank is ridiculous. No, no. you can't. Yeah, no. you're gonna put in a gallon of each every day. <laughs> <laughs> so will I take the two uh, the calcium reactor off of this one? No. But if somebody no brand new is asking me on a 120 gallon tank. Uh, that's brand new and doesn't really have many corals in it. I'd say start with two part until two part doesn't take you where you want to yeah. go anymore, and then go buy that because it, it, mm. it isn't that much expense to. to it's better to do even push the expense out a little bit. It feels a little bit less messy, I think. You know, you don't spill and get little droplets. On, you mm. know, for for those people who want a really clean setup with an open cabinet, calcium reactor does kind of fit that bill. Because you're not really messing with it much. I'm on the fence. I definitely in a big system, high high uh, uh, high consumption, no brainer to use a clean material. Uh, you, uh, or if you actually need phosphate, use a natural material. Mm -hmm. uh, and for a high consumption tank, the yeah, it's not great, great, commercial great, commercial great tanks. But for a brand new tank uh, and a, a smaller average size one to go into the living room. A and B. Yeah. Uh, well, there was a part of that where we also were planning for where the tank is now. And so putting the calcium reactor online, uh, following our you know, success that we've had on the 160 before, your guys' success with the calcium reactor. But, you know, the way you guys uh, uh, approach minor and trace elements, are you supplementing? trace elements or anything or it's all just, it's just strictly water changes the amount of volume of water that comes out it actually does make a uh, an addition so that's a good point actually in your systems there's so many water changes through selling corals that like it's still a viable option it might be a viable option yeah. this is the problem i have with trace elements is I know full well you can have a really successful tank without dosing trace elements, right? I, there's no question in my mind. But I also know full well that depriving an organism of elements that it uses for metabolic function is going to decrease the health of that animal. And the reality is, is I can't really detect the health of a coral to the degree that if it was missing molybdenum, I would know. <laughs> uh, and so. In the end, if I can maintain closer to natural seawater, I can just kind of eliminate that conversation from my mind as long as it's easy and there isn't a lot of mm. chance of overdosing, which could be just as disastrous mm. as letting it deplete. Yeah. It is not clear. And I, this is one of those things where I'm pretty certain we'll never have a, a satisfactory answer to trace elements because I don't think we have a satisfactory answer for humans or dogs or cats either. Right. Yeah. You know, and those industries are obviously much bigger than the coral health industry. If that was the case, one multivitamin pill would be the same for everybody, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's just not true. Yep. You know, so uh, and like all the corals in your different organisms uptake things at different rates. I don't think mm -hmm. you'll ever have a satisfactory answer other than you can absolutely maintain a, a successful tank without worrying about trace elements. There probably is some benefit from doing it right, 
as long as you don't do it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Take what okay. you want from that. <laughs> I mean, is there anything else to add to Trey Sullivan's uh, other than that? No. Uh, it's probably less than 0.001% of our focus. Yeah. yeah. I think for I think so. for us, since the, we filmed this episode, one of the biggest things was adding the Tropic Marin Trace Elements to the, uh, mm -hmm. to the Bulk Reef, you know, two-part. Uh, in which case, I wonder, you know, wh what would this been... How would this been any different if we were still on two part lead, uh, at the point where we're using trace elements? Well, so a lot of those trace elements actually st stayed on it, man. Brings mm -hmm. out the pinks, brings out the greens, oh, yeah, yeah, brings yeah. out the blue. And we, I would love to know, man. Yeah. Like, well, it, look at it that sounds pink. very. <laughs> the pink looks great. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> it sounds very uh, snake oily, to yeah. be honest, yeah. man. But like, I've never actually tested it. And there's tons of stuff that we actually test and we're like, wow, that worked better than I thought it would. Uh, and they actually did what they said. So I, like we ha the answer is somebody's got to do some kind of controlled experiment because what if dosing, uh, you know, Coral Deluxe in a bottle actually really did bring out blues and make them just pop? Well, would I you, want that. Would you use it? <laughs> I would say every non-advanced hobbyist would want to do it and yeah. they would do it incorrectly. That's, that's great that's answer. Our, that's, pretty, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. Uh, you're, you're definitely playing like almost like nutritionist mm. at this point. And I can yeah. barely play nutritionist for myself. Cool doctors. Yeah, yeah. I can barely do it for myself. So here's the piece of it. The easiest possible way. And everybody will actually out there will come out and chastise anybody who says water changes as a solution for trace elements is wrong because they're right that it's a diminishing return. But dude, it is definitely the way to not mess it up entirely. Yeah. Right? So a good and, and what I guess I, I would even go farther on is to say water changes as a regular portion of your system is probably one of the biggest determining factors of whether or not you'll be successful. Yep. There'll be five guys who'll raise their hand right now and say, no, 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 I, do, uh, I don't do water changes and I'm just fine. Okay. And great, man, you made it there. Uh, but if you're asking even that same person quietly behind the scenes and say, if I took 20 new people and I gave them the advice that don't do water changes and I told the other one do a 10% every week, which group will be more successful? Yeah, and even they will tell you. Uh, they know for sure. So if you really think about it from take a step back, not just my own experience, uh, yeah. that I lucked out and somehow made it. And also, by the way, my tank's only two years old. What happens at five? No. Uh, different, different question. Yeah. Um, and actually, the reverse is true, too. I've seen tanks that are super old and don't do water changes. Well, that's a different question, too, because that person has so much, not just uh, nitrate phosphate uptake from all the coral in the tank, but those corals are actually taking up impurities too, right? right? They're taking up all kinds of elements of pollution in the tank. Like, most people don't know it, but when you're feeding those pellets, you're actually adding copper to the tank in most cases. There's all kinds of things right. in, the, in that that if you never had any export method, it just builds up. No, these, it just goes to show that these animals are extremely survivable. We're just good at killing them. <laughs> it's the truth. I mean, think about how many times have you seen a, a special on Netflix or whatever, you know, some TV segment, and they're talking about microplastics. It's in their guts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it's part of their DNA now at this point. But they're still alive, somehow. Mm. So mm. Uh, they're, they're beating it out. All right, next one here is, uh, what do uh, corals eat, and how do I feed corals? Another one where if you asked me 10 years ago, everybody told you you don't need to feed your corals, even though every single person who's ever dived on a reef actively watches these things eat at night, and it is a major source of nitrogen and phosphorus for them in a world that there's almost no nitrogen and phosphorus available. Crap, I know it because I've watched you guys tell us to use the coral amino from Brightwell, which I thought was crap. Uh, we used it the way you said. Yeah, it brings it corals back to life. Yep. It adds color. It's amazing. It, dude, it is absolute crap for anybody to say it doesn't work. It's not true. That, that form of food, though, it doesn't take a lot of energy for a weak coral to yeah. digest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see the biggest improvement in a weak coral. Yep. Well, that that's what we found in our experiments and stuff too. So you, you specifically said we will take a uh, like a chalice that's showing skeleton and put it in this you know amino rich water and uh, and feed it and it comes right right back around not only in tissue growth but in color in tissue you know you know voluptuous you know big puffy tissue and whatnot. 
And uh, I think was it, we did this experiment after we found that they were doing uh, mm -hmm. the Brightwell coral amino stuff. And you guys are mixing it in your regular fish, daily fish food too, right? You're yeah, like, but they also dose it to the and system. And they dose it straight to the system. Yeah. But one of the biggest things that, that for anybody who is interested in using aminos, they have to know, that's the first thing the skimmer pulls out. Oh yeah. Mm. So if you're gonna if you're gonna use some sort of carbohydrate, fatty acid, amino formula, whatever it I'm is. Sure you turn it off. Yeah, that skimmer's gotta be off. Okay, what's mm. the number one source of coral food in the tank though? Probably fish waste. Because yeah. it's happening all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Funny you say that, we have a lot of fish in our bare bottom tanks. Without the fish, the system just tends to look pale mm. overall. Mm. So I'm I got this is just my own anecdotal theory. Right, so you can add you know part particulate foods to the tank, and the, the problem is, is all these corals eat to uh, have to like evolve to eat very specific things at very specific flow rates and all that other stuff. Uh, but when a fish eats you know food and then digests it and uh, poos it out, it's going to come out in a whole variety of different broken down sizes and uh, states of, of uh, nutrition. And what I've learned is that most of the fish have pretty poor digestive tracts and don't actually pull out most of the energy and nutrition from the food. And that's why that fish waste is actually so nutritious to the corals. Not all that dissimilar from uh, you know manure and feeding yeah, animals anybody uh, who does for crops. Knows that. A plant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you see it in aquaponics, you see it in all mm -hmm. kinds of different things. So, you know, aquaponics, you use you tilapia know, and feed tilapia mm -hmm. and yeah. then ultimately grow food out of it. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, uh, I was really interesting because I never, before I met you, I never thought of fish turds as uh, actual <laughs> food for the coral. It's actually distasteful the first time you say that out loud. Mm -hmm. But it's food for uh, all kinds of plants that we actually eat. Jasper uh, eats his own. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I have a dog that does the same. <laughs> high, high, high nutrient food, man, I guess. Uh, still has a lot of it because you haven't really digested all of it well. So in that case, man, like, I totally see, it's not like some magic thing, like you put fish in there, magically the mm. tank is going to like transform. Uh, there is things that go into it's it. I feed the fish. The feed uh, the fish like poo out more mm. food for my coral. Yep. Think about an herbivorous fish that's literally eating all day yeah. long. How mm -hmm. many times do you think that fish goes to the bathroom? <laughs> so yeah, like one of the options then becomes instead of like buying every fish, their coral food known to man. Mm -hmm. Doing what you guys do is, hey man, figure out a way to feed a small amount of food frequently throughout the day, feeds the fish, also feeds the coral. So the learning point for us after this episode and talking to WWC was the DIY reef chili. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, we saw how you guys prepared your foods, you know, you made your own mix. It wasn't one you buy off the shelf, it's chop up seafood, you know, put these amino acids in there, seaweed. add these buffers, add some seaweed. They're like, you're creating a diet for everybody in, the, in that tank uh, so that when you do broadcast feed, uh, the fish that need the the uh, algaes have it. The fish that need the meats have it. Yeah. But uh, you know, feeding the very diet like that also means that if fish is, uh, I would imagine that if a fish's uh, digestive system is not well enough to break down or isn't uh, doesn't break down efficiently everything, well, what if they're getting a completely varied diet than that sing single pellet that they uh, get every single day? Now they're uh, offering an oh, even wider variety of food and uh, food particulates to the different corals because, mm -hmm. like you said, they're specialized for different pieces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, anecdotally, uh, definitely the tanks do better with fish in it, oh, yeah. and they actually the do best better when you feed them more frequently, small <laughs> amounts. Uh, you can add all that up to whatever you want, uh, but it's true. Uh, another one here is uh, how do you do water changes for a dream saltwater tank? Episode sixteen. Uh, I, I don't. Know, I think we already mentioned it. We talked about this one. Yeah. What are your belief on water changes? If you, if somebody said, "What's the perfect water change <laughs> system for my tank?" What would you say? Ten percent a week. I agree. Ten percent a week. Keep a single week. Turns it, out to be 30, 34 percent in a month. Thirty-four percent. Well, we found if you do that, uh, if you say you add uh, five uh, nitrate uh, a month, uh, you know, through your filtration and your feeding, mm -hmm. it will. Uh, or I should say, if you're adding it, like, what was it like? One nitrate per month. It will never more than double at thirty some yeah. percent water change a month. It'll never more than double yeah. the normal amount that you would put in in a single month. So yeah. month two will never go higher. 
Yeah. Right? Uh, and so it's just stable from that point on. As long as you do a 10% water change, it's also 10% uh, is going to uh, decrease the amount of uh, 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 the effect on trace elements o over time. Yeah. It'll still have a trend down, but an occasional big water change uh, mm -hmm. can actually bump that back up in the yeah. same way that you guys do in your facility is occasionally, man, there's a big sale. Yeah. Right? And all of a sudden, <laughs> then you move through an enormous amount of water out of these systems. Yeah. You know? So the only time I would think the 10% uh, rule doesn't work is on nanos or pico tanks. And when I mean nano 10 gallons and under, uh, George had a pico recently. It just looks really good. And I just set up one maybe three months ago. Mm. And every time if I go more than three days or so without water change, the tanks start telling me. Mm -hmm. And the fluctuations are so much that I try to change twice a week about 50, 60 percent of the tank, but we're talking about three gallon tank. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. so a gallon but the tank a little flourish, but again, it's, yeah. it's a different scenario. I just wanted to bring that out there. Yeah. Okay. At one that, point in time, I was doing three water changes of 100 percent a week in the tank, yeah. and it looked incredible. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's like my 40 gallon here when I first got here to BRS. Uh, I would change uh, like 80 or 90 percent every week just. Because we had water crazy. available. Because it was we, easy, I had, too. I had Your a hose, I suck it out, and I have a hose that fills it up, I'm done. Yeah. Yep. But talk about like one of the nicest, happiest looking tanks. Uh, it was clean all the time. Yeah, do I have water change <laughs> in the 1500? You'll be there for three hours pumping water. Yeah. So people talk all the time about like how picos and stuff like that are really hard because water chemistry changes so fast. Mm -hmm. But what you just described is uh, grab a one gallon pinch grip like suck the water out, dump it out, yep. stick it in my bucket, pour it in, dude. Done. That all that stuff is garbage oh. now. Yeah. That's not true. Mm. It's just twice a week can I do this, and then uh, the, it's, <laughs> not, it's, not it's not true anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Within three minutes, I got a whole water change. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny though because of the fact that I was doing the entire volume of the tank. I mean, down to the point where I would suck up the recordia mushrooms on the bottom. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the corals would stress a little bit because it's it's a hundred percent change mm. <laughs> they don't know corals are naive right a lot of times you can get you can take a coral and put it into a bad system that's already been fixed and they don't know anything's happened but in this case it's not like that you're literally taking them out of one them. body and putting them into a completely separate body but the fact of the matter is the environment is right mm. you know I've seen so many tanks where people do 90% water changes, suck them to the fish are flapping around on their yeah. sides, like you say, like the yeah. people talking about, that flourish. Oh, yeah. uh, but if oh. I had to tell you in a normal size tank, if anybody's looking for advice from my counsel, 10% every single week, you won't be disappointed you with won't the fail. results. Nope. Right. A, lot of, a lot of times people are shied away from that if they live in the freshwater world though. You know, mm -hmm. you can kind of get by with the whole 20% every two weeks mentality as a band-aid, but mm -hmm. optimally, for sure, once a week. I will tell you also the people that uh, shy away from the water change of 10% a week are people that get crappy advice from people uh, that yeah. do otherwise and also haven't rode that out for five years. Yep. Uh, and they're not testing nitrate and phosphate yep. or anything. Right? They don't know that it's skyrocketing. So uh, another one here, uh, we're getting close to the end. To monitor or not monitor your reef, this is one of the biggest... <laughs> For you okay. guys. <laughs> Ep episode 17, to monitor or not monitor your reef, will it save your tank? This was a big one because when we walked and talked to you guys, we obviously uh, used a lot of Apex stuff here, yeah. and you guys did Zero. not. I remember the look on your face. Yeah. Even when you said, I will give it to you free, will you use it? And Josh says no. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, I'm like, so how? Very funny you say that. So we have used Apex controllers a few times in the past, and what we use them for is just for real basic... Um, um, alarms and alerts. Yeah, and alarms and alerts, uh, mm. pretty much just to turn the pumps on and off, to oh, turn the yeah. lights on and off, to turn the power heads on At and off. At the time, we were using a lot of T5, so when they would go in You'd for photography, they would them. push a button yes. and then take photos. Yeah. So, so for that aspect, I can see how it's very, very valuable for you to understand what are the critical things like do you want to find out when your tank reaches 90 degrees or you want to know, hey, it's 78, it's now it's 80. You want to get an alarm of some sort when it gets to 80 so versus walking into a hot mess, you know, yeah, yeah. a bleach mess. So if you're going to give counsel, not based on what you do at WWC, but if somebody asks you, uh, how should customers? I take care of my, yeah. yeah, when your customers ask like, hey, do you think I should have a monitor on my tank at home, what would you say? Yes. Okay, if, why? If, why if, is it different? 
you answer that one, but I got the answer for that one as well. Why is, why is it different? Because there's a couple of things that are critically important that don't waste time. In Florida, your tanks are going to get crazy, crazy hot. Hot soup. <laughs> right? I mean, mm -hmm. in some situations. Mm -hmm. um, your pump can't be off for very long. Um, what else? Your, your, your power heads are not on. You need those operating. So there's some things that are, they just hold the key to the life support. And, I mean, if you happen to be at work and you can't get back for a couple of hours, then, I mean, you kind of want to make plans to preserve that $30,000 in investment that you've got in your living room. And the difference, too, we have a full staff <clears throat> yeah. pretty much seven days a week. So you happen to put your hand in a tank. Oh, it seems a little warm. 12 oh, hours. Of, 12 hours of your day is covered. Maybe even yeah. more. Maybe you even know, more, I think yeah. it's from 6 a.m. Yeah. to 7 p.m. I think it's 13 hours mm. or something. Maybe even 8 o'clock. 300 and uh, how many days a year there's somebody there for 12 hours a day? Rough. 362 Rough. days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and those system water volumes of 1,500 gallons, how long does it take Changes for that to heat up so or cool slow. down? Yeah. They're a lot more right. stable. So yeah. I, I agree. So that's the main reason, you know, but for someone's home, we set up pretty much, I would say 90% of our installation um, that we've been doing, they get an Apex full controller, tried in the whole shebang. Well, you know? yeah, it allows us, it, it, there's another layer to that. It allows us the ability to um, reach out to the customer also. And yeah. let them thing. know, hey, you're out of town. I just want to let you know, we're going to have to make a visit to your home. So in our case, <laughs> uh, I told this and you guys were shocked by this, but the Apex saves a tank at BRS about once a month. Uh, on <laughs> I believe that because you got yeah. so many of them. What do you got, 50 yeah. tanks? Yeah, and there's, least. A, there's another piece of it, though, is nobody's here on Saturday and Sunday. Mm. That Ooh. tends to be the point at where it saves it uh, yeah. the oh, most wow. often. And also, it's because there's 50 tanks. Time, so it's 50 times the likelihood that this stuff will happen. It's worse All here. Individual. You're cold. Yeah. Oh, yeah, cold is uh, like the... You know, cold and hot are terrible both in their own ways. <laughs> uh, uh, but, I mean, like, hot, at least you could solve with a fan. You know, uh, well, cold, man, it's ex expensive, high energy to fix. And we have we have issues with heat, too, because uh, the heating and cooling system in this mm -hmm. building is tied to, you know, weird rooms. So you shut Ryan's door, and all of a sudden it's 82 degrees in there, and you're like, well, I wouldn't have known because the cleaners on Friday, when everybody was gone, shut the door, and now I have an ambient temperature and that's saying, hey, too hot. in Inside yep. the you're inside your room, it's 80, but your tank's 82. Mm. Yeah. I don't have the ability to rewire the entire HVAC system here. So <laughs> yeah. There's times, many times, where somebody shut that door in the summer and it got super duper, or actually in the winter, yeah. to keep up with the heat. Yeah. Yeah. The cooks in there. Yeah. Uh, there's room behind those. Mm. Yeah. The, like, the, the, the thermostat for my office is uh, in the hallway for the bathrooms. <laughs> uh, like, it's just insane in the in the office over here. So, but in any case, yeah. uh, of all of the the tanks here, about once a month it saves a tank because not necessarily that it like got triggered a whole bunch of series of events. It just told somebody, man, to come here and save the damn tank. Yeah, you know? yeah. there's there's a bigger component for us. You know, we have people who are one qualified to look at these corals and, and visually see that there's something wrong, mm -hmm. you know? And like you said, we're there a lot. Yeah. But then also too, there's enough, there's enough time in a day where we're just physically there. It's somebody who doesn't even know that water shouldn't be on the floor knows that there's water yeah. on the floor. So I think know. this this episode we learned after, you know, within months after we this episode came out was, uh, we didn't do the mo well, we had the monitors and alarms on this tank, but we didn't set them up right. And guess what? We lost a ton oh, yes. of fish. The power outage. There now, was it a happened right here over the weekend. Lost all the fish. And it wasn't a it wasn't a building power outage where all the other apexes in the building would have said, "Hey, uh, 50 of you guys are right. offline. Something's wrong." This one was we didn't have a setting turned on the local oh, wow. GFCI outlet yeah. on this tank flipped. And it wasn't until Saturday morning when somebody in the warehouse who was like, hey, those fish are dead. I should probably call somebody. If we would have had that, the power monitoring things that turned on on their thing, it would have said, the G or it told us we're out of power, which in case was just the GFCI. Yeah. We had come in here and saved it. Yep. Yep. Right? And the reason you ask why it wasn't set up is because there's 50 Apex in here. We make mistakes, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it is uh, you know, just a constant learning lesson. But yep. 
this is the, the piece that, you know, is the community debates. Should I have a controller? Debate that one at a time. Oh, yeah. Do you want to, to uh, have all kinds on. of automated setup stuff? Yes. That the part that not one person, not one will debate. If your tank just hit 86 degrees, would you want to know and how fast? Yes. Mm -hmm. so yeah. There's your answer. You need no, a controller. Not single person says, I don't care. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, man. Yeah. Uh, so, like, the monitoring piece is, let's figure that out. Figure out how to monitor your tanks because the difference between a two-year successful tank and an eight-year is when you inevitably run into all of those problems. And you will. And you will. Mm -hmm. uh, they happen here on 50 tanks about once a month, which means over 10 years you're probably going to run into a half dozen of these things that would have been the point at which your tank just died, yep. or it'd be the tank point at which you saved it, and you can tell the story about how you did. <laughs> uh, next one here is uh, 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 is really reef tank uh, fish with a purpose. So this is utilitarian fish. This changed the way that we talked about cleanup crew, cycling, you know, forever, going forward. I don't think we were talking about you, uh, fish as utilitarian purpose until Josh says, fish are your cleanup crew. Oh, yeah. yeah. He gave us a list of the fish that he wants in there. Give yeah. them to us now that you would you would put in any tank and for what reason. Easy. Yeah, yellow, some some zebra soma, whether it's a purple or mm -hmm. a yellow or a gem tang or whatever fish you need. Uh, a bristle tooth, a convict, uh, naso. Grasses. Yep, and then definitely down the list of, of some sort of picking fish, mm -hmm. be it a scooter blennies, uh, you know, chorus type or a pseudo colinus like your six lines, copper band butterfly mm -hmm. to keep Absolutely. the aptaceous off. So in that, that conversation is the obvious bit about algae and keeping it at bay. So there's different mouth shapes, like so the zebra mm -hmm. thesomus, like the, the yellow tangs mm -hmm. will yep. eat different types of algae than uh, the, uh, like the white tailed mm -hmm. uh, uh, bristle tooth, which mm -hmm. is kind of more like I love that filamentous fish, uh, like stuff that's really small on yep. there. Uh, and then, you know, when you start to go outside of that though, it's like, it's not just algae. It's you add those wrasses, mm. and you may very well add flatworms or nudies or all kinds of different things to your tank, but you'll never even know. Yeah. Because those guys are eating them all day long. Exactly. They're workers. <laughs> it's better to put them in the beginning because if the tank has an outbreak and there's now thousands of those things, he's just not that hungry, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. We have had before this play tank, and we think we have zero aptaceous, right? And for some reason, the copper band just start picking up corals. It's, it doesn't happen all the time. We remove the copper band. Guess what happens a month later? Aptasia outbreak. Yeah. There's an aptasia. Mm -hmm. There's an aptasia. Oops, aptasia was there. The fish was just keeping it under control. I had that first experience with my own tank, my first tank ever. Tank was flourishing, did awesome, looked beautiful. I wasn't actually doing my water changes like I should because it's my first one. Uh, and uh, uh, then one day, the yellow tang died. Boom. Tank okay. just fills with algae, man. Like I'm like, then I just sat there on the couch, like what that happened? Right, all he did all day long was eat algae. Man. <laughs> <laughs> that like the cows of the ocean, they're grazing all day long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I replaced him, put a new one. All the algae gone. Imagine that. Boom. I don't know, just that simple. And like, I kind of remembered that thing, but it was like when you told me the utilitarian thing, it's like, how the hell mm -hmm. have I not connected this? that tightly mm -hmm. to the point where like if somebody asked me how to set up a brand new tank i would say you've got to get a tank as big enough to be able to have one zebra stroma like a yellow or a purple tank and one uh, bristle tooth tank at least one uh yeah. bristle tooth tank yeah. like so those guys can come in a little Tamini, smaller size whatever yeah mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like but you want at least those things because you'll be way more successful it will look cleaner you'll be happier and it'll be way less work uh, it's it, a different way of keeping, you know, in our little pico tanks that we're talking about, we don't have that luxury. No, we you throw a couple hermit right. crabs in yeah. there and a couple of snails and hope for the best, right? Mm -hmm. and Keep your water good. Algaes, you know? But, yeah, there's a bunch of different things you take it, it or you I take I want my tweezers and they're getting little leafy algaes and stuff. Convict mm -hmm. tangs and nasos, they eat a lot of those really weird algaes mm -hmm. like Y branch and ulva sometimes, you know. And, and nasos will lead that uh, the wolfer algae, the, the black one. Ulva. That get, mm -hmm. That's what it's called? Oh, yeah. yeah. So only nasos, the only one that I've seen them eat that, you yeah. know, so. We had an ulva outbreak in the 160 for a while. Nasos go crazy mm -hmm. over oh, there. Yeah. They go yeah, crazy. A while ago. So one thing, even the fish that are not utilitarian, we're technically using them as such by pooping and feeding our corals. 
So when we put a bunch of, let's say, chromates and antiates, we're thinking of the volume and the poop is going to help the coral. So technically, they're all being used in our farm. Yeah. So if I could give a guy a guidance to anybody starting a new tank, make sure it's big enough to put some tangs in there. Yep. You probably want to add a RAS, like a Helichorus. Or if not, we'll call the tank police on you guys. The tank police. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, like a, 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 a six-line, or a six-line that will mean, uh, but they'll Put them last. Work. Six yeah. lanoids are great fish, just put them very last. So it's not going to be mean to nobody. So they'll hunt those little pests down all day long. Chorus rats, one of the yellow yeah. ones, super cheap fish. Like those. Hunts They're all day long. Too. Jumps. <laughs> uh, uh, but also, even those super ugly tile fish, uh, or not tile fish, file, file fish. fish. Yeah. The FTJ 18 file fish. The reality is, is you are probably going to add Aptasia to your tank at some point in time. It's just real, especially if you got an LPS tank. <laughs> yeah. If you add that file fish, you may never even know. Yep. They may never, ever, ever know until you kill the file fish and then they uh, erupt. Little disclaimer, I'm amazed you yeah. got a file fish here and it's doing that good in a reef. Usually they don't do that as well. Yeah, because they're they're yeah. lower energy fish, right? So mm -hmm. the high energy of an they SPS eat, dominated they eat system. They eat LPS, they yeah. really start chomping. Once they start chomping, they're very aggressive. So This tank got impressed. riddled with uh, uh, Aptasia, like to a super mega problem. Well, the fish is doing great. I was looking at them yesterday. Because I uh, added uh, coral uh, coral and algae from the 160. Uh, and it, I introduced to Aptasia here like nobody's business. Uh, so, so like even the best. So they're there. You, know, you just don't see them. You make oh yeah, they're no longer a problem, man. Because we have in this case we added a whole ton of those nudies, which will take a while. Uh, and, and you got Molly Miller. The they're known for eating Aptasia. We still haven't. I haven't seen them we, eat them we in heard, here. We, we we've heard it. that, I mean, way back in the day, but uh, I mean, the speculation was that the they only yet. eat the little clear baby ones. There is one piece of this. One piece of this that I think is really important to listen to, though, which is if you add the Aptasia file fish afterward, uh, it now needs to eat thousands of them, right? right no. If you do it beforehand, it'll eat the four that are in there and keep it consistently at bay. Yeah. Same thing with the nudies, same thing with the flatworms. If you try to use it, it's the ounce of prevention versus a pound of cure. If you wait till you have the problem, it's too late. So starting yeah. the tank with these things and just kind of assuming you're going to get exposed to mm -hmm. them, you're lucky if you don't. But if you do, you may never even know. Yeah. One last one here. All right. Uh, episode 18, how to maintain a saltwater tank for stability. So it's maintenance here. What has changed uh, since 2019 in terms of how you would maintain a tank? Anything? Better technology, I will say. No? Mm. I gotta grab a straws for this one. I don't think so. I think it's just same the routine, same, same yeah. thing that's been working, though. Yeah. I mean, well, because it's like, to think about well, it's like the, the, the 293, your, your maintenance rhythm was, it was a lot of soft sand, so there was somebody, you know, constantly vacuuming in it. It's because uh, it's also a display tank right there in front. You know, your 500s, all these other ones are getting manual water changes, plus you're harvesting corals out of there. Uh, so awesome. really then it all comes down to like, you know, keep the glass clean and uh, every once in a while suck out some big traps of detritus, but yeah. given your filter floss and what I wonder even, and the flow uh, and what you've guys done with flow, I wonder if you even have that problem. No, dirt pile is still a problem. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> we get dirt piles in every single tank that we have. But I think maybe after you kind of recap that, maybe the only thing that's changed is we don't use any of the finer grade sand anymore. Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. We use the special grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's flatter on top, so it actually grows coralline algae. Mm -hmm. So it's more like a bare bottom tank if it was to be yeah, a... We, we find them a tough time with the fine sand. Yeah, the fine <laughs> sand was a pain in the butt. I guess I would say for me, just reaffirm that the water changes 10% a week, maintenance is the right move. Uh, if you say, I don't want to do that, then auto water changers now are readily available in a way they weren't uh, as popular in 2019 as they are today. Uh, so. It make it easier if you don't want to do it, but embrace the fact that this is a high percentage path to success. I would also say that I don't really care what nutrient level you're at. Whatever your maintenance is, should just make sure that it's not it's zero line. zero and it's not uh, uh, perpetually rising. Don't and be a make yo -yo. It, Make adjustments. Don't be a yo-yo. Be, be conscious of the fact that it's going up or down because that's another problem too. Is they just don't simply check sometimes. Well, that's well, a part of maintenance too, right? Yeah. Doing the tests yeah. on tests. a regular basis. So like you know. But now you got tools like you know the Trident sure. to do your mm -hmm. major three, but and you now all I have to do is do a little. That's what I mean by uh, technology. You're not gonna do it. 
You got the Trident now. You got automatic water changes. You can check this from, you can be in Japan looking at it, you know, and just. Well, no. That's what I meant by, like, the maintenance changed a little bit for some people. I was talking to one of your guys in the back and asking him, what are those pipes going up? He goes, oh, those are automatic water changes for all these tanks that we're testing. I'm like, fantastic, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. So That's those things, five years ago, they weren't so doable, you know? Yeah, I, I, the one thing is, what, what do you do with the tests, right? And so, mm -hmm. like, back in the day, I just never tested nitrate because I didn't know what to do with the result, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, how frequently should you test, uh, blah, 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 right? And there is no real number, there isn't any no. consensus, consensus. This is what the consensus, I believe, should start to hone in on. And we'll maybe someday find the right pegged number that's the most important thing ever, I doubt it. But I now know I should test nitrate probably once a month. And the only thing I'm looking for is, is it trending up, trending down, and then I can just adjust my feeding and my filtration to not let that wildly get out of control. That is my only goal. I now know what I can do with that information, which is I'm on a path to continually polluting the tank or I'm on a path to stripping out all the nutrients and starving everything. Uh, just fix that. It's not about pegging to the perfect number or perfect ratio. That's the right? So I think from a maintenance thing, I know what to do with my tests. I know water changes are kind of the core of the whole thing. Uh, and I know how to adjust my filters now. The refugium isn't just an on-off thing. I can actually light longer, shorter, higher intensity, lower intensity. Uh, I know that I can choose to fill, change out my filter socks or not even use the filter socks. I now know how to size a protein skimmer better, especially if I'm gonna use filter socks. I know that adjusting the air in the filter, in the skimmer is actually more effective at tuning it mm -hmm. than uh, adjust, adjusting the stupid water level with the gate valve. So you adjust these filters uh, and... Uh, a lot of people rig them, they put a little valve at the end to control the air that you're getting on it. It works. Yeah, it's, like, it's a, a foam engine, man. Like, water level doesn't change how it creates foam. It just changes the place that you collect it. Uh, so uh, we know so much more than we did in 2019, and it shows now in the results. Uh, you guys have seen the video. You'll probably see it covered in this one. But, like, we had a bumpy road for a year, but two years after that, you can see the tank just flourish oh, and come <laughs> in. It's, I think it's the best looking tank here right now. It is. Yeah. You just killed it. Uh, so, and what this was though, wasn't a BRS, you know, executing on all our, all our great knowledge. Oh yeah. Uh, and it wasn't actually in this case, worldwide, uh, all their great knowledge because they have different application to a farm, application to home, how does it come together and when we're all working towards the same goal, which is helping you guys have uh, more success, bam, we're finding the pass every day. So, all right, man, thank you guys for coming out thank so you, much. Buddy. Thank you for all the hundreds of hours beforehand. Yes, sir. Thank you, buddy. And I'm so glad we kept this journey going, man. <laughs> cool, man. Uh, actually, you know, if we wanted to see this tank close up, because uh, we just shot some really gorgeous footage of it yesterday or the day before. We should Ooh. probably put that like Ooh. up here. Right and then here. if you want to see Ryan at WWC on, on WWC's oh. channel, you should check that out. We did a tour of their facility, see the whole Three thing. Unbelievable, we go through all the back, everything, you gotta see it. Go to their channel, check it out, subscribe, yeah. great stuff's coming out of there. YouTube, Worldwide Course. <laughs>